uh, we will be moving into the deep dive section uh, where we today will be concerning ourselves with narrative and framing in a political perspective. Uh, more to the point, we'll be looking at how uh, media frames uh, the narrative of, uh, of leftists of uh, political, uh, like uh, the deficit uh, was for 20 years, the biggest hammer anyone could swing at anyone else was talking about the deficits, was talking about balancing the budget and making an allegory to balancing the budget uh, be more or less the same as balancing uh, your own checkbook, which is nowhere near the same in any way. So uh, I have uh, I have a bone to pick with uh, Chris Matthews. Uh, uh, in this uh, election cycle, and uh, not to mention with uh, regards to the Iraq war as well. And uh, so I uh, chose uh, Chris Matthews uh, to show, uh, as a showcasing of how, uh, how the medium and uh, the, uh, a political party such as the Democrats will try and position themselves, will try and talk about things uh, to such an extent that they will uh, try and control the conversation. And then we see uh, afterwards, uh, we see what actually happens. Uh, but also we see how Chris Matthews uh, then uh, all of a sudden changes from stripes to spots uh, in the 2016 election. So, Richard, if you would queue up uh, Chris Matthews 1, um, here is a short example of how Chris Matthews defines the word socialism. Celebrity, terrorist, socialist. Why are the Republicans saying such nasty things about Barack Obama? Let's play hardball. I am socialist. The campaign has started using the S word as Sarah Palin did today in Colorado Springs. So as you can see, he basically intimates here that the, the word socialist or socialism is a slur. And he basically says that, uh, asks why are these uh, Republicans using this word against uh, Bernie Sanders. Now in the next clip, uh, we will see how he is saying that uh, actually how uh, taxes uh, isn't socialism in and of itself. So if we can run the next clip. Well, here's Obama today in Florida. It is true that I want to roll back the Bush tax cuts on the very wealthiest Americans and go back to the rate that they paid under Bill Clinton. John McCain calls that socialism. Yeah, so here we have Obama, uh, shown in the same show, uh, talking about uh, him being called a socialist and his plans being called socialism uh, by John McCain in 08. And uh, what he's saying is that him wanting to raise the cap uh, is in no way socialism. Him, uh, that uh, fair taxes is not socialism. Now, uh, after having done, uh, shown both uh, this clip and others, Chris Matthews goes on to an interview with a Republican uh, governor. So, in which uh, uh, both the uh, Chris Matthews has an interesting take on what a socialist is. Uh, what he's been taught it is, but also uh, we have a Republican governor's take on Obama's voting record compared to uh, a current uh, candidate for president. And with former Pennsylvania Governor Tom Ridge, who's the co-chair of the McCain campaign. Do you believe, uh, sir, Governor Ridge, yes. that Barack Obama is a socialist? And I mean in the term we grew up with what it means. It means have the government run the economy. Do you believe he's one of those well, guys? I think he's going down that path. I don't think, you know, I think, listen, I think if you have a voting record that is more liberal than the only self-proclaimed socialist in the United States Senate, that's Bernie Sanders, there's a suggestion. 
Yeah, so as you can see, he defines socialism as the state taking complete control uh, of the market and uh, the governor, without much pushback from, uh, from Chris Matthews, uh, says that, well, uh, he doesn't see Obama as a socialist, but he sees him as moving that way. Uh, but, uh, and he says that when you have a guy who has a more radical voting record than an actual socialist, Bernie Sanders. So uh, without much pushback on that, uh, Chris Matthews again goes into uh, talking about uh, the uh, word socialist and the political parties and news uh, use of it. It's useful to the American uh, d debate for this election to call one person on the other side a word which most Americans hold in disrepute. Do you believe he's an enemy of free enterprise? Do you believe he's a man who believes in state control of the economy? That's what a socialist is. Do you believe he is such a person or not? Well, I, I believe he's moving down that path. That's not what your candidate is saying. Well, your I, candidates are saying he is a socialist. Well, I think what you, you can. Yeah, so here again, uh, we have Chris Matthews saying that using the S word is not good for a national conversation, ba uh, basically. He's uh, saying to him that using this distorts reality. He's basically saying that nothing good comes of this. And uh, I'm going to um, skip the next uh, couple of clips. Um, I apologize for the way that we're doing these uh, clips. Uh, it's simply because we can't do more than 30 second bits uh, under the uh, Fair Use Act. Um, and we ran out of time uh, to put together a video with these clips in it. But uh, I'm going to skip, uh, I'm going to sum up what uh, Matthews goes into against taxes. Basically, he's talking about the progressive tax system uh, as a response to Obama being a socialist. And he actually gets uh, uh, the governor to agree on a progressive tax system where the rich pays more than the not so rich is uh, a fair uh, tax system and that the GOP agrees with it. But more interesting is that he goes in to say that uh, because the governor says that the uh, raising the cap to $250,000 on taxable income uh, or the tax bracket up, uh, is against uh, achievement, is to put a cap on achievement. And then Chris Matthews says, Obama is a rags to riches story, and he uh, does, he by definition has nothing, uh, can have nothing against aspirations. And I mean, if there is a rags to riches story, how about an, uh, a Polish immigrant uh, who, uh, who lost a lot of his family in the Holocaust? working his way up from nothing uh, to uh, becoming a national contender for the presidency. Uh, but oddly enough, we haven't heard much of that. And in the final analysis, he in the final segment, he goes uh, to bat for Obama and increased taxes, uh, saying that Republicans always want to have big wars, but they never want to pay for it. And Obama, uh, by doing uh, lifting uh, the cap on taxable incomes, just wants to pay for things. So uh, in in summation, Chris Matthews uh, says that the socialism word uh, is a bad word, it shouldn't be used, and that it has nothing to do with what Obama uh, is doing. And if any of you can remember the interviews that Chris Matthews did with both Hillary Clinton and Debbie Washington Schultz, in which he asked them, um, in which he asked them, uh, Sorry, I got a bit disturbed there. Um, uh, which uh, he asked them if they know the difference between a Democrat and a socialist, and they can't answer. He basically keeps hammering away at the, the socialism, uh, the red scare, basically. Uh, so in the next video, uh, if uh, the first video of the next series, if you can get that ready, uh, Richard, uh, Chris Matthews on Bernie. Um, you can see how he very, uh, rather not so subtly, uh, tries uh, to do a hardball, pa a hardball panel uh, on the election in which every time he mentions Bernie, it's as a spoiler, and every time he mentions Hillary, it's as the nominee. So if you can run the first one, please. 
the question. Does Bernie's self-described political revolution, radical revolution, help or hurt the Democratic Party going into November, no matter who's the nominee? I'm joined by the Hardball Roundtable. Roll calls. Jonathan Allen. Boy, you move. Yeah. So, again, he uh, is uh, all of a sudden framing uh, Bernie Sanders as someone who will hurt Hillary in November. That is the baseline of the question he is uh, sending uh, sending to them. And uh, in the next uh, video, uh, we again uh, have him framing uh, Bernie, uh, again, not directly by saying he will be a spoiler from the left, just like Ralph Nader, but by intimating it, simply by accepting it as a premise uh, of fear that this might happen. He is uh, directing the conversation in that direction. So if you can run the next one. Mm -hmm. Those millennials, the people who are not Bernie's existence and success to date help or hurt the party in November? I think it could help with the energy level if things are okay between him and Hillary Clinton. There's always a 60-40 split in the party. Do you think you'll ever drop out and go third party? No. You won't. Okay, Megan, does this whole discussion of the left now, which you've never heard before? Yeah, so this man was introduced as a good guy on the left uh, by Chris Matthews, and this man basically spends all his time on hardball whacking away at Bernie Sanders. Uh, here in this first part, uh, he, he again, he completely accepts the premise that uh, Bernie uh, is uh, possibly going to be a spoiler, that there can possibly be a contested convention, that there can be chaos. And this is uh, the lines along which uh, it is all being talked about. Uh, now, for those of us who are used to scanning media and for those of us who are very much uh, pro-Bernie, this might seem obvious, but to a lot of people it won't. To a lot of people, it will simply be a conversation in which uh, questions are asked. So maybe some people will say, oh, he could have done better follow-ups. But basically, uh, you have the premise uh, being accepted, uh, uh, including by the viewers, I'm afraid. Uh, if we can get uh, the third video uh, ready. Mm -hmm. um, what uh, is happening here is Chris Matthews is going to intro uh, his own little uh, version of a Republican uh, uh, ad against Bernie Sanders in the general election. So if you can run. And when 40% of Iowa voters identify themselves as socialists, I want to say to them, do you know what a socialist is? Uh, I think I... Let me see if that's... That's supposed to be right. Sorry, I'll, I'll let it run through. So we had a little technical difficulty. This uh, is. Do you know what this actually represents? How many U.S. senators call themselves socialists? One. One. And that man, that man has a very okay. good chance of winning New Hampshire. Let's think politically. Forget the ideology. Forget anything about it. Just think the way the Republicans are going to run against this guy. If it's Hillary, who's, who's got a thing going with Bernie, or Bernie. Socialism. Na 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 na. Raising taxes. No, no, no. Revolution. Oh, my God. We're all scared. Isn't it? It's not hard to imagine the volume of attacks in the general election they're going to paint Bernie, his allies, or the Democratic Party is out of touch. It was yeah. the right one. Sorry about that. I mean, that. you can basically see it in his uh, small smile and his eyes, how excited he is uh, about even talking about this, about uh, framing this uh, in this way. Uh, like, it's like he's ridiculing him. It's like he's saying he has no chance. Like, what is he even doing here? Uh, he, they're going to be screaming socialist at him, and then he can't win. That is basically uh, what he is saying. And uh, the way that he's smiling, the way that his eyes light up with it, just uh, goes to show uh, it's like when you uh, caricaturize a kid uh, who has silly ideals or uh, a person who... Uh, I don't know, uh, believes that man will, one, will one, stay, one day, <laughs> that mankind will one day fly, sorry, uh, or speak in coherent sentences, a thing I'm looking forward to myself. Um, so uh, in the next, uh, he actually does the Republican a favor by uh, doing, uh, putting together a small uh, ad 
uh, on behalf of the socialists, uh, but on behalf of the Republicans, uh, where he just hammers away at the social uh, at socialism, just to exemplify what the Republicans could do to Bernie Sanders and how scared we should be of him doing it. And it will be this easy that Chris Matthews, who has no training and isn't even a part of the GOP, uh, can do it uh, on a whim. So if we can learn that. Well. Bernie, his allies, or the Democratic Party is out of touch. Here's Bernie in his own words. I believe that you were introduced as a socialist. I am a socialist. Uh, Are you a capitalist? No. We will raise taxes. Yes, we will. You've said before you'd go above 50 percent. How high? We haven't come up with an exact number yet, but it will not be as high as the number under Dwight D. Eisenhower, which was 90 percent. There's a rumor going around that you were a conscientious objector. I did apply for conscientious objector status, yes. But I yeah, so once again, we have Red Scare clips, basically. Now, those of us who knows Bernie well and who knows his agenda well and the way that he thinks well, uh, knows that uh, he's not a socialist. He's a democratic socialist. Uh, now, uh, to be, I hate saying this, to be fair to Chris Matthews, uh, the Republicans wouldn't care about this. They would do uh, an ad in which they only had him saying socialist and only had it uh, taken out of context. But for him to be uh, misrepresenting Bernie Sanders to his viewers as a socialist, uh, effectively being the one invoking the Red Scare uh, as a host on MSNBC, uh, a supposedly leftist network, uh, is amazing. And basically him doing the hatchet job of... Uh, uh, doing the hatchet job of uh, Hillary Clinton's campaign and the DNC uh, for him. Um, now, uh, if we can jump to clip six. Um, uh, no, actually, let's uh, take clip five. Sorry, Richard, uh, don't mean to confuse you. Uh, in, here in clip five, again, we have, um, again, a framing uh, of Bernie Sanders. And again, this comes... Uh, so, from the supposedly uh, good left guy on the panel that Chris Matthews started by introducing. Um, so if we can run uh, this little bit. Seeing the Democratic Party split over a long period of time, Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton in 2008, and what did she do at the end of that primary? She went to the mat for Barack Obama. She did, gave a concession speech with a full throat endorsement. She went to the convention with a full throat endorsement. If Bernie Sanders doesn't do that for her if she's the nominee, uh, he's taken a, a much different path. I think if the Democrats... What's worse for her? I remember, he, he joins he, her he's, or he challenges her. Remember, he's not a Democrat. I mean, he, he has this moment, but for most of his career, he hasn't, and he's fought against he's, the Democrat. He's a Democrat when he wants yeah, he isn't a Democrat. Uh, will he back Hillary Clinton just like she backed Obama? He's worked against Democrats most of his career. And uh, I mean, th this is the way it's being framed. Now, here comes the subtle thing, which is we have this woman stuck in between an old wizened man and a very big burly man. We have this woman in here who actually tries to apply some nuance, but because she is squeezed in between these two people, because we've had this giant lead in of all the problems and troubles of the left, of lefty spoilers of Ralph Nader's and so on and so forth, uh, Chris Matthews is able to dismiss all the nuance she tries to put in here with just one word and a look. So if we can roll the sixth clip. Is the ideas he's advocating, including that 50% tax that was just mentioned, 50. are not that not unusual in Western democracies in Europe, France, England even had a 50% tax and as recently as two years ago. What is the most biggest threat to him in the Democratic Party is convincing people that his ideas are actually not that radical. And when the electorate believes that, we will have seen a fundamental change, not only in the Democratic his, Party, we had but national, nationwide. national spokesman on here yesterday who said he is promising radical revolutionary change. And again, ending with a smile, ending with the, <laughs> yeah, yeah, little child, sit down, let me tell you how things really work. So this is, of course, just one example of how uh, 
one uh, anchor is doing this, but it is everywhere. It is pervasive. Uh, if you look at the questions that uh, Bernie Sanders is uh, posed with in interviews and in roundtables, uh, in town halls and reverse town halls, you see that Bernie Sanders gets questions uh, like, how are you going to pay for this? How are you going to get your radical ideas? Like, again, using radical or radical agenda and your lefty agenda. How are you going to get it through a conservative Congress? How are you going to do this, this and that? And then Hillary is asked, how come you have so much experience? It's so amazing. How are you going to solve these problems? Uh, they never ask her, oh, um, so you know that country, Libya, that basically burned to the ground and all the arms uh, of the former Libyan arm, uh, army is now spread all over the Middle East, empowering ISIS. So what were your role in that? And what are you going to do to clean it up? Like, she never gets that question. She never gets the question. You uh, said that you were the victim of a vast right wing conspiracy in the 90s. And the right most certainly hasn't grown any more endeared to you since. How are you going to get anything passed? How are you going to get anything done ever? Uh, she's never asked those uh, questions. And when uh, she finally gets into a, uh, into an interview or into a debate in which she's actually clinched uh, into a corner by someone who actually takes her to task, most of the time the moderators jump in or she completely denies the basis of reality and there is never, ever any follow-up. They more or less every time change the subject, change the topic right after she gets into trouble. Uh, and they always use time or a format or something or other as the excuse. Now, that's not to say that Bernie hasn't gotten fair coverage at all. He has. There has been some relatively fair reports done but you can count the minutes on approximately one hand, whereas Hillary Clinton has gotten a lot of good press. That doesn't mean that she hasn't gotten bad press. She has. The email scandal, I, I mean, no one can deny that MSNBC and CNN and ABC didn't milk that for everything it was worth. Like every piece of rating they could get on that, they tried to get. But that to say that because she got that uh, amount of uh, unfair coverage or that amount of negative coverage and to correlate that with Bernie Sanders being ignored for months and uh, then being laughed at and then being spun for about three months of the primary last three to four months ever since he got competitive more or less ever since New Hampshire they have just spun him as a spoiler, as a loser, and it's everywhere. And it's very subtle many times. Uh, you can even see uh, uh, center-left uh, blogs that have been trying to be fair, how they are now picking up uh, the pressure that they're feeling from the media, from the other blogs of party unity, instead of saying, no, reform, multi-party system. This is broken for a reason. Why do we have delegates? Why does that even exist? Well, it's very, uh, it's very simple. You're a big country, and your system was uh, invented before railroad. So that is the answer. That's why you have delegates. That's why you have national conventions and local conventions and county conventions with these amounts of months in between them. That is why you have them. There is no reason to have them anymore. Just have an election, have a ballot with candidates and multiple parties on it. And then you set, put your little X on it and you drop it in a box. Then you count all the ballots under supervision of the other existing parties so that they police each other so that no one can cheat. And then you count them and then you say, oh, this guy got the most, but he didn't get uh, enough to uh, actually have a majority in the Senate Congress uh, to get the presidency, so we can uh, we have to ally with another party. Oh, so now we are you telling me we now have like two parties having to work together to find compromises, and they are actually 
if they follow anything that resembles uh, resembles European parliamentary tradition, they're going to have an eye out for long-term legislation, which means that they're going to try and get as broad a coalition behind legislation as possible so that the legislation is assured for a long period of time instead of just having two partisan parties that hate each other, vilify each other in an attempt to get more uh, political power. I'm sure when Nixon uh, did the whole Southern strategy, he didn't uh, think to himself, oh yeah, I'm going to hate on some black people. He thought, oh, this is a temporary evil so that I can get some temporary power and so I can do some important stuff. But the problem is when you serve up hyperbole to get elected again and again and again, what's going to happen? Some of these people that you indoctrinate with hyperbole are going to say to themselves, oh, this shit must be true, pardon my French. Uh, I'm going to run for office. Or my son, who I have been feeding this stuff to his entire life, or my daughter, who's been fed this stuff his entire life, is going to run for office, and lo and behold, that person gets elected. Now, is that person going to reach across the aisle? No, of course not, because you've been taught that they're the enemy. You've been taught it by your politicians, you've been taught it in the election seasons, you've been taught it by your parents, but uh, as important as all that, you've been taught it, it by your local community and by your media, because your media, especially in the past 20 years, is framing everything as them versus the others. There is nothing that is being framed as the, uh, I mean, not nothing, I mean, you have the uh, inauguration speech and what, approximately two days after it, there's a, a no fire, uh, no uh, ceasefire uh, for about two days after the inauguration, one or two days perhaps, in which everyone talks about, oh, coming together and we're one America and there's more things that unites us than separates us, which I'm sure was true when JFK said it, but today I even believe it's still true. The problem is perception is becoming more and more reality. And the perception is that Democrats are the enemies of the Republicans and that Republicans are the enemies of the Democrats. So that was a very long spiel. Uh, Richard, please give me your two cents before I run completely out of saliva. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, happy, happy to get in there. Uh, I noticed uh, that... And we have no sound on you, Richard. Oh, am I, am I not coming out? That's, uh, that's weird. And there's still no sound on Richard, uh, so I guess I'll have to... Okay, yeah, here yeah, he comes. Right, right. <laughs> hmm. Oh, oh. I see. I see. Now, now, behind the behind scenes, the scenes what's, going what's going on here is I got multiple browser, browser instances, instances open and, and, and a whole lot of other things, things. so you're probably, you're probably getting an echo right now. I apologize. But but I'll try, I'll try and correct that. And, and if you want to keep talking. Okay, so I'll just be keeping on talking. So uh, let me uh, talk at great length about Richard. Uh, so uh, Richard basically is doing uh, all the work that uh, usually you have four people for in a control room. And he's doing the news and he's now uh, joining me in the deep dive segment. So... Uh, yeah, so uh, Richard is basically uh, an octopus, and he's doing an incredible job, in my opinion. That uh, includes, uh, of course, uh, a, a couple of whoopsies and whoopsie doos, but uh, that just happens. So, I mean, Richard gives himself uh, too much of a tough time, in my opinion. I, I... Oh, no, thought I resorted with all of it. I'm still, I'm still here in Echo, so you guys probably still here. Let me see, Let me if, see I if I can. can... That, might, that might work. Huh? Huh? No, no. <laughs> I'm trying. I'm trying, man. man. I'm trying. I'm trying. <laughs> I, 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 we <laughs> had some, had guests, some guests on today, today and, and I hadn't run through, through getting all the, getting all the audio worked out. So, I again, I again apologize. I did want to just mention that you reminded me of how. There's a great movie about the how that indoctrination can come back and bite you in the in the ass, to say, so to speak. And it's called it's a comedy movie called. The I'm Infidel. sure you meant the donkey, not the other thing. <laughs> yeah. and it's a comedy movie called The Infidel, and it's about basically an Arab man. Uh, spoiler alert! Okay, I gave you a warning. Uh, finds out he's Jewish, and he had uh, basically been his daughter had been being indoctrinated by. Sort of by him, but in a comedic way, but then also by all of the other 
uh, nefarious minds that are out there trying to influence impressionable young children. Uh, so, but I, the only here I don't know. Go ahead, and you probably didn't hear any of that. That should resolve it. So, <laughs> you missed it. Uh, I'm not sure anybody else did, but so here we go. Anyway, so, along the narratives that you mentioned, I think that the uh, socialist one was one that I picked up right away. Was uh, when, and I noticed Chris Matthews in particular was one of the first people that I picked up on, and he was the most prominent about it. There was the incidences of him going back and forth with uh, DWS and other Democrats about. Uh, what is a socialist, and trying to get them, uh, okay, and so now I'm still muted, apparently, <laughs> so I sincerely apologize for this, I don't know if that's an old message here, uh, and this seems to be, you said you're hearing me? Uh, all right, <laughs> uh, let's just, uh, how about that, are, are we, uh, is that, is that coming through now? <laughs> okay. I'm not hearing this now, so I don't know if uh, what happened there. Sorry, guys. I this is just getting into a, a wreck audio-wise. So uh, apologies, apologies. Uh, I'll try and get you guys back to this and see uh, what what's going on here. Uh, oh, oh, I know, I know. Is that gonna work? No. All right. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I got a late notification. Just messed everything up. Uh, so I don't know. Uh, go go with this, and uh, I'll, I'll I'll be back. There we go. Oh my god. Oh goodness. Ah, oh, Windows 10. That, that's that's what's doing me dirty. I think I finally got Nissa's audio going back. Uh, up. Yeah. You so no one can hear anything. Yeah. Now uh, the stream. What I realize now is that the stream's 30 seconds behind. So they were telling me what they were hearing on the stream, and so uh, I was adjusting in about 30 seconds lag to what was being said. And so each time they said something, it was to what I had already just fixed. And so now we should be good, I think. Uh, so give it about 30 seconds to clear up. Sorry so much, guys. Just to let you know, no, no, this is uh, had another uh, hardware issue. And we've so, uh, on, so can you guys on. hear me now, yeah. uh, or can you just hear Richard? They should be able to hear you now because I can hear you, and if I can hear you, they should be able to hear you. <laughs> It'll take a moment for the stream to catch up. Again, apologies for all that, but you know what? This is it, this is part of the learning per curve, and this is what we're doing, and we're well, very happy to take. Are we both loud and, and clear now? It's going to take. They're watching the okay. stream. So if you ask them a question, so it's going to take 30 seconds we're to gonna try it again. But I still can't hear Richard. You can't hear. Uh, Richard. So <laughs> I don't know Richard. <laughs> I, okay, that, I, uh, that explains uh, why. Okay, so um, yeah, I, I'm. Uh, thank you, everyone, for trying to help out by uh, telling us uh, who you can and cannot hear. Uh, so I wish that you guys being able to hear Richard was enough, but the problem is I'm not gonna be I uh, I'm not gonna be able to have a conversation with Richard uh, if I cannot hear what he's saying. So unless someone of you can transcribe what he's saying in real time, then uh, <laughs> I'm gonna have to just continue on on my own. Uh, so Richard, uh, you had something to say about socialism and the narrative picked up by Chris Matthews. Do you want to take that away, or you want to work on the problem some more? Uh, so, uh, all right. Let me see. Okay, so he's going to be uh, working on the problem. So, uh, yeah, technical issues, technical issues. Why would you not? Uh, so, if you take uh, FDR, if you take uh, the New Deal, and this beautiful uh, Google picture of me on top of my face. Uh, if you take FDR and the New Deal, uh, the Great Century, or uh, the uh, the greatest generation that ever lived, uh, th these are uh, narratives that are 
sometimes consciously created uh, and sometimes uh, uh, they are sometimes consciously created. Like you will uh, have PR people or even politicians sitting in a smoky bat room going, oh, we should talk about this in this way because that will have these people come with us. This is uh, something akin to what happened vis-a-vis -vis the Southern strategy for Nixon uh, when he picked up the former Dixiecrats and they constructed a narrative in which a way in which they could talk about uh, white issues in the South without actually saying uh, the N-word, without actually saying that uh, white people are better than black people. They would just frame it in a certain way. Uh, so this actually does happen deliberately. Um, but like uh, talking about the Second World War uh, as uh, a thing that America won um, is to some extent done deliberately, but also to some extent uh, done organically. It's the way that Churchill talked about it in his great memoirs. It's, uh, it's the way that the French remembered it. It's the way that a lot of people remembered it. It's the way that uh, movies, the first movies that came out in the West, which was of course uh, dominated by Hollywood, it's the way that they were portrayed. Uh, they portrayed uh, Hollywood, of course, being in America, portrayed the American side of the war, uh, thus D-Day. And of course, you have a tendency to embellish your own importance. You always have. Uh, so, uh, it is, uh, I believe that the narrative of how America won World War II uh, was created was in part organically, but also in part geopolitical strategy, uh, a way to do favors, a way to do political uh, exchanges with uh, foreign countries. Uh, but when it comes to framing, framing is more subtle. Framing is a way you talk about things so that you can try and uh, turn the way that you uh, that people think about a subject, but also a way that you talk about the same subject, but in different words that all of a sudden gets a new meaning. So for example, uh, Hillary Clinton uh, found out by opinion polls that she uh, seemed too rigid and too loveless. So she tried out this new uh, framing of herself and her stances uh, in the Middle East as being, uh, it, it lasted about two weeks, but uh, about her being for love and patriotism, being part of loving your country. And uh, that way uh, she could defend her foreign policy as being patriotic and uh, supporting the troops at the same time as she could try to uh, be more sympathetic and empathetic in the way that people perceived her. Uh, now, this didn't work in any way, but if you go back uh, a couple of months, you will see for a, a couple of weeks, uh, her and uh, her surrogates on TV uh, tried out this strategy, but it did not pay off. Uh, other than that, you can take a look at uh, the 90s and the 80s, uh, the way that uh, they talked about the more or less wholesale destruction of American infrastructure and uh, manufacturing was that, oh, it's an economic, uh, we are on the upturn of an economic downswing and uh, we have to manage the deficit and uh, we have to give businesses uh, the room to maneuver that they need so that they can hire more people and this was the way that they framed what was actually happening was we need to pad Wall Street's uh, credentials. We need to boost American uh, economic power was what they actually was doing at the expense of the American manufacturing uh, industry, among others. And the same as framing it as a war on drugs it becomes okay for police to aggressively move into a neighborhood and knock down doors because you're in a war. Now, can you hear me? This, uh, of course, uh, the people in the neighborhood will, a lot of people in the neighborhood will most likely not see that as okay. Uh, but 
people outside of the neighborhood, maybe even people who share an ethnicity with the neighborhoods that this is being done to, these people will more and more accept it because the war on drugs never comes alone. It is always shown as, oh, these are the poor drug addicts. And these are the evil drug dealers that are doing this to our society and destroying our cities. So we're in a war and then you see police ramming down a door and then you're okay with it because look at the misery that this is causing and look how evil these people are. And they even shoot at police, we hear. And then you see people banging down a door and you're told that this door at least, uh, there were criminals behind it and they confiscated uh, drugs and it was a great success and you are completely left out of the loop of the nuances of what is actually going on of the human suffering of the uh, prison industrial complex of a lot of things that simply isn't being told to you because the framing is as war the war on drugs you might read a couple of op-eds here and there in some of the more courageous uh, uh, newspapers where uh, opinion pieces will uh, talk about the war on drugs as uh, questioning uh, how, uh, how effectual it was back in the 80s and 90s. But most of the journalists would go along with it because it's a war. And it's the same thing that happened with the Iraq war. Uh, I'm against the war. Why are we in the war? We shouldn't be in the war. We shouldn't uh, create this war. And then the war starts and then the entirety of the media landscape shifts radically to say, well, I was uh, against the war before it happened, but now that my country is at war, I wanted to win. That was, you could see it the day they launched operations in Iraq, the second uh, Iraq war, you see it across all of American media, with the exception of the Young Turks, if you could call them a media back then. But with the exception of them, you see it across the entirety of the media spectrum that they completely shift, and the exception of democracy now. Uh, and it actually takes uh, a couple of years before MSNBC, that Keith Oberman will later say was founded uh, as uh, an uh, 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 in opposition to the Iraq war, uh, MSNBC, they see that the left is so heartenedly against the Iraq war and that now it's starting to be safe to be against the Iraq war, or at least to criticize it, that MSNBC starts framing themselves as having always been against the Iraq war. But if you go back and you find uh, the early clips uh, again of Chris Matthews, you can even find a YouTube, a recent uh, Young Turks uh, expose on this, in which they show Chris Matthews uh, harping on uh, meeting the president and how wonderful a commander in chief he is and how presidential he looks and how he just won the entire women's vote when he landed on the hangar in the fighter pilot uniform and with the mission accomplished uh, behind it. Uh, these are the ways that the media tries to stay within the framing that they believe that they cannot exist without. So the reason that they go with a war narrative is simply because if you're against a war, then you're unpatriotic. Because you frame the war on drugs as a war on drugs, as uh, it being combatants in a war zone, you can't be against it because if you're against the war, then you're for the drug dealers, then you're not for your country. So it becomes harder to speak out against it. And that's, uh, I believe that the war on uh, fill in blank here has become so pervasive uh, everywhere. And yes, Angel, uh, Angel Tips, Bernie was always against the war on drugs. Uh, he, he, tr he did what he could. But uh, you see uh, the war on Christmas, the war on religion, the war on atheism, the war on science, the war on the left, the war on the right. There are wars everywhere now. So uh, I believe that they're starting to lose their effectiveness, uh, a bit like the dot-com bubble. 
uh, where everyone built a website, uh, picked up subscribers to that website, and then sold it for millions because it had to be worth millions, which it then sh uh, turned out to not be. Uh, Richard, uh, I may not be able to hear what you're saying uh, in any way, shape or form, but I simply need my partner in crime, so to speak, to take over talking for a little while. Yeah. So if uh, you can pick up uh, on my uh, uh, narrative and the wars and so on and so forth, I would be grateful, especially if you could take me off screen so I could get a drink. <laughs> Absolutely, not a problem there, Ness. I'll take. Uh... Now I can hear you. <laughs> and now you can. Now you can hear me, huh? <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Well, well. Now that we sorted that out, uh, I think you uh, mentioned a lot of important points there, and uh, I think one of, like you mentioned about the war on drugs and how that was part of this narrative, helped build and basically rationalize or justify it. And I'll get you off screen here just for a second. Sorry. And uh, basically, uh, what was going on or what happened in addition with that is like what was i it was covered in some of the previous clips uh i don't remember if it was on our show or if it was on benjamin's show but uh about how essentially the sorry i just <laughs> distracted me all over the place try to keep a train of thought here anyway okay my point basically being is that we saw an increase in policing of uh, certain communities and some of it uh, justified and some of it not so much uh, out of the cri uh, criminal uh, or the act tough on crime bill and that whole mantra that came out of the 90s and in late 80s. And what happened besides the destruction of black families across the country and the over incarceration and the harassment and the assault and the, the abuse and the killings and all the things that we see going on now, but before we had cell phone cameras, so people not only got away with it more often just in general, they were more brazen about it because they were less concerned about getting caught. And so, you know, what we saw with Rodney King and all those, and before that, you know, it's like before we had these video cameras, these things were still happening. They just weren't getting reported on by the, pe the victims. They were getting reported on by the perpetrators and their associates. And so... Uh, the, I, the concept we have of what more or less crime means, what you know, effective policing versus not effective policing means, and all those types of things have been shaped in large part by the democratic narrative and mo a lot of it out of the neoliberal and somewhat out based off the conservative mentality that both Hillary and Bill share out of Arkansas in that general mind frame. And so I think that there's a, a lot going on there. And one of the other aspects, I suppose, to it that uh, I wanted to mention was that along with all of that destruction that I mentioned, there was a, oh, I lost my train again. But essentially, my, I guess my point was, is that if we go to Beverly Hills and we start over-policing, stopping everybody that looks suspicious and everybody looks suspicious, like in New York where they stopped more young black men than there were young black men. So we, we go to Beverly Hills and we start stopping every young affluent white male I bet you we're going to start coming across more cocaine, more other drugs, and suddenly it's going to look like the crime rate, the drug crime in Beverly Hills has skyrocketed, when in reality all that's happened is the police actually started looking for it. And so I think that the, that the broken windows mentality, that look at policing, the we'll think about how people end up being criminals later, all of that led to a lot of more problems that we're seeing now 10, 20 years later. And so... I, I, I think I don't think that can be under or I don't think that can be overstated as far as how devastating the narrative around crime and being what being tough on crime meant from coming out of the Democratic Party. So that that I think that's an important part that you picked up on there. Uh, and it looks like we had some uh, comments from. Uh, uh, yeah, we have some comments from the YouTube section if you want to pick up on them. Uh, yeah. Uh, Looks like a BS opinion mentioned that our politics are also about crisis management as opposed to long-term infrastructure and solutions. And so wars and cliffs and apocalypses become the common theme. And I think that's an excellent point that essentially we've turned our politics into madmen from, you know, the ad men that were just absolutely ridiculous with basically taking any piece of knowledge that they were able to grab about how the human psyche works and how they could influence uh, people based on that and that's gone to our pol political side so that essentially the, what, the best way I think of it is some of the sophists from way back in Greece uh, where essentially as long as I could convince you that what I was saying was right I was right and that was the end all be all of it and so it w didn't matter what 
what an objective truth was because there was no objective truth. And so as uh, based off of that logic, as long as I can convince you to agree with me, then we're right together. <laughs> like, and so that, I think, has been applied to our political system in a way that's become incredibly destructive so that, like as B a BS opinion mentions, that these crises are the only way that we have, are able to get things done, even when it's not really a crisis. You would, the, I won't think it would be far. We're far from a time where renaming post offices will be put in headlines as you know an important breaking headline that we need to address this. And what are we going to do if Congress can't get this name settled? And like, and so that's I think where we're heading, and I think it's going to be uh, troublesome. It looks like a going on with uh, so poverty or BS opinion mentioned also that uh, so poverty and gross inequality stopped being a sign of barbaric society and started being a punishment for deviance from uh, certain educational and social norms under the guise of meritocracy and uh, An Angel Tibbs uh, mentions blame the victims as their modus operandi and they absolutely nailed it that is 100% accurate in my view in that and uh, Malcolm X there's the great quote uh, about they'll have you loving your oppressors and hating the oppressed and i think our media it, 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 you can't find very many more poignant things to what's going on today than some of the things that malcolm was talking about then and it's scary frustrating and disheartening and sometimes to think that you know these things were getting pointed out then and we're still struggling to start to address them now or even just recognize that that's what's happening and i i think that uh, what Bernie has a lot, a lot, a lot, or what Bernie and the circumstances of our economy have allowed is that a lot of uh, progressive white people who had uh, previously not necessarily been as engaged on some of those issues and understanding the oppression side of things as deeply, I think uh, that what's happened to those that are in poverty and those that are even not in poverty but used to consider themselves middle class and has had their middle classdom just walk away from them essentially as wages stagnated and things became more expensive. And so though I think for those people, Bernie and things like the Nevada Convention and some other things have awoken people to just how how horrible the disenfranchisement feels, even when it's something that seems slight to people who aren't engaged in it in the way that you're engaged in it. And so I think that that's been a very powerful uh, counter narrative to what's been going on from the DN uh, Democratic Party. That's despite their best efforts, I think, and it's just part of a natural reaction of human beings interacting with each other. And so I think that's been really huge as far as the narratives go. And uh, I guess uh, on the socialism narrative, I, I did also want to just uh, touch on that Bernie could do more to just walk away from that, but I think that he picks that fight means something to means something to him that he doesn't even really necessarily portray. And I, I'm not exactly sure what that means, wh why he wouldn't just go out of his way, like whether it's an integrity thing that he's worried that people are going to say, oh, no, so now you're not that anymore, or what about, and I know we've talked before in private about uh, how he might have been further to the left with his associations with the Socialist Party. So uh, when he disassociates with the party, why then does he keep the moniker and, uh, and continue to fight that fight? And what, is there any benefit to it? Are, are we gaining knowledge in the general public about what socialism is or means in a way that uh, enlightens people to understand that uh, democratic socialism or socialism blended with capitalism can lead us to a more prosperous and better uh, future? I don't know, your thoughts? Yeah, but here's one of the scary things uh, about definitions that most people don't like. Uh, we had uh, some of this conversation with Adair uh, the other day about uh, facts and uh, exact science. And uh, academia doesn't operate in, in exact quantities. And uh, as Adair, who is, uh, what was, was it a physics um, uh, major uh, he was doing, or was it the biochemistry? I can't remember. Uh, he's, a, he has a, he's already done a lot of biology, and he's going into physics, and he's always been interested in, in the sciences and such. And so it will, he's going to be a great guest. We're going to have him on next week. So make sure yeah. to tune in next week, Thursday. He's going to be on. He's a Washington State delegate, an awesome guy. Uh, very pleased to m meet him and uh, happy to have him representing me at the national convention. And so uh, definitely tune in for that, but go on, sorry. Yeah, so uh, he, he is uh, most likely going to be a regular contributor, if not a permanent part of uh, Project Sanity or the Progressive uh, Army, uh, alongside a BS Opinion, uh, who I've, uh, in an email exchange over several weeks, have uh, finally clamped down. 
uh, to uh, doing a hangout call with me and uh, take the first step to uh, uh, helping out uh, on a regular basis. So uh, we uh, had this uh, conversation uh, where uh, we talked about certainty. And even in the natural science, uh, there are no certainties. There, uh, they operate constantly with uh, conversions uh, of numbers, with uh, all sorts of things in which they say, well, if this is true, then this should also be true. But there is the very important if in front of it. So uh, the act of certainty uh, in, for example, saying, oh, are we educating people about socialism? Well, uh, historians don't agree on the diff definition on socialism. The you, you can look up on Wikipedia, uh, you can look socialism up on Wikipedia, and you will get a page about a mile long, and it has about 10 subsections uh, under it. And you can, uh, you, you cannot find one definition because socialism, while it had a very certain meaning when Marx uh, made it up, uh, or created the term, uh, it immediately started evolving simply because human beings entered the equation. Uh, so you immediately then have other people who also call themselves socialists, but don't agree with other socialists on certain issues. And then you have people who call themselves communists, and then you have people who call themselves communist socialists, and then you have people who call themselves democratic socialists, and then you have people who call themselves socialist democrats, and so on and so forth. So then they'll say, oh, but the original idea of the word, yeah, there was once, uh, for a brief period of time, an original idea of the word. But if that is all the word is, then everyone else who uses the word are wrong. And so, so basically, that, that with uh, it's going to be a, a, a detailed, nuanced issue that really it's more important to find out what they, where they stand on particular issues than it is to assume that a moniker is going to sum them up in a way that... Exactly. Uh, oh, oh, so basically you're saying there's no chance that we're going to settle that and get it worked out. <laughs> is that, that what I'm hearing? No. <laughs> okay. okay. So what I'm saying is instead of seeing yourself as enlightened or clever or intelligent because you have read a definition of a word or uh, one study on one subject, uh, instead we should, instead of... Uh, saying, oh, I want to educate people. What you should be uh, wanting to do, in my opinion, is uh, open their minds to different varying possibilities. So instead of accepting any term of socialism as 100% true, thus being able to use it as a label, simply have it as a part of limbo. There's a limbo around socialism where there are varying degrees of meaning of it. And yes, at some point you get so far of the reservation that you no longer can call it socialism. Now, where is that boundary? Uh, da, 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 da. Yeah, no one like, can yeah. exactly say, but you'll know when you've crossed it if you have like sense. Yeah, you would uh, think, but there is the Westboro Baptist Church, and I'm <laughs> sure they still call themselves Baptists. And. <laughs> like... Yeah. And so and is like now if I you know if I say you know those Baptists over there, I think a lot of Baptists would get upset if I was using the Westboro Baptist Church to to sum that up. So I think yeah. if you just take a socialist country like let's say Venezuela and you use that to paint all of socialism, then you know you're probably going to get or some Marxist definition or whichever which if you use that to paint everyone, then you're going to get some pushback and I think rightfully so. And so yeah, exactly. And exactly. I think so. I think it's really important that yeah that we do that that we think about the nuance about what we're talking about and about how that even do it with Republicans and people on the right too. give them, yeah. give them the credence I mean, I to get, be able to separate I their positions. From serious the pushbacks. Whenever I say, well, there are good guys, Republican too. I can get some serious put pushback online. Like, well, maybe back in Eisenhower's days, there might have been one. Like that is basically what it will boil down to. Because the idea of Republicans today is that, oh, Republicans are the uh, crazy Trump supporters. Uh, they are the crazy, we hate Muslim people. And there seems to be a growing proportion of those people in the Republican Party. But as you can see, the Democratic Party has gotten a large influx of what you, back in the 90s at least, called blue dogs in the Democratic Party. Well, those are all of them former Republicans. And, and, <laughs> they they no longer found that they had a place in the party. 
so they moved over here. That is one of the reasons why the Democratic Party has taken a right swing, is because it tried to be a centrist party, appealing to a lot of people. And the Republican Party couldn't do that, so they, only, they could only go to the right. The only problem with putting yourself is in the middle as a centrist party is that if you're exclusively a centrist party, if you're not a central left or a central right party, but exclusively a center party, then you don't stand for anything. Yeah, and I would and just then, say, moving into the future, and since we're running real short on time, I want to make sure to, that you have a couple, little bit to get out there, uh, just that the future is different. Young Republicans overwhelmingly support uh, gay marriage. They support uh, women's right to choose. They support many of the social issues that have long stood between the Democrats and the Republican Party as large social issues that make it impossible to vote one way or the other if you think, if you have a belief on one side. And so... Uh, the young people are, are changing that, and I think we, I have hope that we can move that into the future. And uh, if there is a centrist party, that it's centralized on social issues and being common sense rather than on neoliberal economics. Yeah. Okay, so that's more or less uh, it for us tonight. Uh, I apologize for the technical issues, but uh, we are, uh, especially Richard, are doing everything we can to polish the show as much as we can, including at some point getting a background for me that doesn't include my children's drawings. Uh, Tell me. <laughs> uh, I want to give a shout out to Benjamin Dixon, who... Um, who has us here on his channel, giving us a uh, boost upwards in uh, viewers and uh, plugging us as much as he can. And I want to give a shout out to Anoa and her show, The Way with Anoa, and the incredible job she's doing uh, on her one-woman show. Uh, she does it with little help, some, but very little help. She's uh, basically a one-man, uh, one-woman machine of productivity. And I want to give a shout out to uh, Phil Winter, uh, also known as The Ill Mechanism on uh, Twitter, uh, for all the great work he is doing in sending us uh, articles. And uh, as usual, I want to give a shout out to David Grossman and Dr. Hyde behind the scenes in the YouTube chat and uh, doing uh, helping us with prep work. Uh, behind the scenes of Project Sanity specifically, we have Jennifer Louise Ogden, uh, Jay Lockton, at Jay Lockton uh, on Twitter, uh, who's doing our graphics. We have Dave Conan at Field the Burn TV on Twitter, who does our amazing uh, video segments and updates from the California primary. We have uh, Kelly Bacos at Shameful63, uh, who does whatever is needed. And we have Richard Green at Progressive Green and myself, Ness Peterson at Scandianvia, uh, who are your hosts of the show. And with that, I want to end our uh, show with a small piece made by the Bernie Sanders Brigade in which they uh, got Susan Sarandon to speak into a phone about, with a message for the voters and the uh, volunteers in the California primary. Thank you, everyone. Good luck and good night. I want to say I'm so proud of you for uh, getting the facts and following your passion and, and uh, supporting Bernie. In California, it's May 20-something. May 23rd. 23rd, that you have to change your affiliation if you're an independent. You, ha you have to make sure that by May 23rd you change. And then, uh, and also, of course, register to vote. But uh, feel the burn. I mean, this is the guy that's your guy. And this is... This is a very important election. It's not just an election, it's a movement. And what happens during this election is going to decide the future for many, many years. Because you're never going to get a candidate that is not already bought, except for Bernie Sanders. So if this guy doesn't make it, and it's up to you, we're depending on you guys. Register, make sure if you're an independent that you change your affiliation and get out there, bring your anybody get them educated as to the uh, all of the various uh, reasons to vote for Bernie because there's so many and uh, love you bye